Anyways, we're all good. Yes, it is. All right. Good deal. Everybody hear me fine? Good. Well, awesome. Well, we could just go home uh, after that, right? Uh, that was fantastic. Jake did a, uh, an excellent job uh, laying out some of those concepts. I appreciated even hearing uh, a few things presented in a different light, um, perhaps, than I've, I've heard before. This isn't uh, a new topic to me by any means. Let me see what time I'm starting so we can try to hit lunch on time. Um, this isn't a new topic uh, for me. Um, in a lot of ways, this has been uh, a decade worth of time digesting and searching and studying and spending time uh, with spirit going over these things. I would have been uh, raised like probably many and most that Jake was referring to, just the kind of, I'll just use this word, just the typical um, teaching concerning the end times. Matter of fact, even when I was a teenager, we dove into it. When I say we, I mean my friends and I, as teenagers in high school, dove into this extremely strong uh, in a dispensational, premillennial, just to use big words for you, uh, premillennial concept, uh, or just simply said the rapture teaching. Uh, I dove into that series. Uh, a TV guy, maybe some of you have heard or seen, I think he's still on TV somewhere, a gentleman by the name of Jack Venimpi, uh, back in the, uh, this would have been the early 90s, uh, put out, I believe at that time, it may have been a 15 uh, VHS, right, back in those days, uh, VCR uh, series, 15 cassettes worth, uh, I think it was called Revelation Revealed, if I remember right, and it was 15 uh, cassettes worth of Jack Van Impe going verse by verse through the book of Revelation. Well, my friend and I, uh, my friends and I, our Friday night fun was to get together and put those DVDs in and sit there. I don't know, we're, I'm just a geek that way, I guess. We just, would that, we didn't go out to parties and do those kind of things. We got together and did a study Revelation party and we would dive in there. And so anyways, I just say all that to say that that, that was my upbringing, my background. Uh, I dove in and studied it, uh, you know, in those teachings as well, the dispensational. Um, uh, understanding and grid work of scripture would have been, uh, again, my background and upbringing and uh, kind of towards my late 30s or late 20s. Holy cow, how many decades of that now? Uh, uh, back in my late 20s, uh, I, I, I'd always had some questions and snags, even if with that amount of teaching uh, that I had uh, done and been through and study that just kind of didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. The fear thing really bugged me. Um, it really bothered me uh, how much we couldn't go and do, uh, meaning what we couldn't do in culture, in society. Uh, we're told on one hand, we've got to disciple the nations, but we're told on the other hand, we've got to come out and be totally separate from everything. And in my brain, is a little bit like, now, how's that going to work? How are we going to disciple nations? Well, probably at that time, maybe I at least only understood that to say we're going to go get a lot of people saved in all of the nations. But the word disciple is not the word saved. So when Jesus said go disciple the nations, he wasn't say go get all the nations saved. Although we want all the people of all the nations saved. Is that right? Disciple means to be disciplined, Right. And so if you're a disciple of Christ, you're one who is disciplined in his ways, you're disciplined in his thoughts, you're disciplined in the fruit of the spirit. Can you hear that? And so when we're to disciple nations, that's not just individuals, although individuals make up nations, right? But an individual is not a nation. It takes a collective group to be a nation. And so if we're going to disciple nations, then we must disciple the ways nations operate and function uh, and work. So nations of the earth are to be discipled in the kingdom. What Jesus say the kingdom is? Love, joy, peace, and the Holy Ghost. Am I right? And so the nations of the earth should be disciplined in the ways of love, joy, and peace. Well, now hold on. Just that alone causes you some serious conflict with the teaching that the nations will be ran by some single person called the Antichrist? If the nations are discipled in love, joy, and peace, how does the Antichrist, quote, ever get power? 
Because how are you going to buy into this figure called the Antichrist if you're discipled in love, joy, and peace? That's going to be a little tricky, right? And so I'm just taking you back to when I was a teenager. My brain just hitting these walls going like it. And then when, you know, even on that front, um, uh, pardon me, I can't remember if it was John or Peter, when first, second, third John or first, second Peter. I'm losing the reference right now. But when I think it was John, when he was writing and said, the Antichrist is here even while I'm writing this. Thank you, first John. Um, in my brain, I'm like totally tripping. Like, I thought this guy was, we're still looking for this guy. But John's saying he's here while I'm writing. Okay, so someone better figure out how to answer that situation because you're telling me the guy hasn't been here yet and we've got to, he's still going to come out of the Middle East somewhere or out of the White House, I don't know, whatever vein of prophecy you want to follow in that regard. Uh, so those things began, those are some serious trip ups for me because I had a very strong passion uh, to make an impact in the world and to unlock the glory of God in the earth. Uh, I had a very strong passion uh, for that, but yet I was being told it better all get done within my lifetime because we're the final generation. Whew. Most of you may know this, growing up as a teenager being told you're the last generation and you've got an entire world that has to be evangelized within your generation, you want to talk about a thousand pound weight, right? So what kind of life does that put you in? But a constant hurry up, you got to go, go, we don't have time, you get constantly, right? You just got, got to go, 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 go. So I'm caught up in that situation. And so uh, everything is, excuse me, everything is totally motivated and pushed by this fear that the end is going to happen at any moment, right? How many of you have seen these awesome, matter of fact, I was just down this way Tuesday night uh, doing some work in the studio uh, and driving back up home, which is three hours from here. Uh, there's an amazing uh, orange harvest moon hanging out over the Ohio River as I was driving up Route 7. It was just killer, right? How many of you have you, I remember being a kid and seeing those things and thinking, oh no, it's happening, it's tonight. I mean, all of a sudden these, I, now they call them blood moons. I don't remember hearing the term blood moon back then per se. I just knew that the, it was said to be that the moon was going to turn to blood and that thing doesn't look white like it normally does. So whatever that was, I remember specifically my mom and dad being at an auction house uh, one Friday night and I went out to the car. I went out there and that thing was screaming orange red, right? And I thought, Oh no! I mean, you know, that you know when you wake up and you're a kid and your parents are outside and you didn't know it and the house is totally empty and you thought I done been left behind. You ever miss church meeting on a Sunday morning and you're driving down the road and there's no cars anywhere and you're like, oh man. And then how many? Uh, thanks, Jake, for bringing this out. How many? prophecies have to keep being told that never happen until some point a generation wakes up and it begins I think it already is but at some point we have to start saying what what Jake read to us out of Deuteronomy that if you're going if this is going to continue to be prophesied and said and never come to pass at some point somebody's probably going to have to start challenging that kind of prophecy at some point, if we want to be true to Scripture, then we're going to have to stand up and say, that, that, that's not working. I was in junior high in 1988 when there was a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. Those are the most three intense days of my lifetime up until that point. Every night going to bed scared to death. I mean, you want, I about stayed up all night in prayer just to make sure. Because, right, you got to be good enough to go. Right? Because uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't interested in that tribulation deal. So you got to be good enough to go. You got to be good enough. Enough prayer. Enough sin not doing. Because, Lord Jesus, don't you be caught in that back seat when that trumpet blows. That's what you're told as a teenager, am I right? So that you're motivated by fear to not get in the back seat? I'm just saying, I'm, I mean, uh, don't be caught. Don't have MTV on when Jesus comes back. 
<laughs> so I'm talking tonight. Nobody watches MTV anymore because there's no music there. But uh, back then, I'm just saying, you're told these things, right? You've heard this kind of, because you're said that if you don't have all these things doing right and going right and you're not holy enough, you're not going to go. And so those three nights in September 14, 15, whatever it was in 1988, those three days for me was, you know, I suppose on one side there was a spot that, uh, you know, maybe I had a personal revival because of my pursuit of the Lord to make sure I made it. Of course, when those days didn't happen, I was like, well, now what do we do? Oh, I know. We'll rewrite the book and say I miscalculated it. It was actually 1989. I'm not making it up. The guy did it. The guy wrote the next book after selling millions of the first one and was wrong. He rewrote it and said, oh, wait a minute, I was off a year. My math was bad. And millions more bought it in 1989. Well, you've got plenty more just this year alone. The amount of books, multi-millions of dollars worth of books that was bought over the blood moons. And we still here. And there's no return policy on those books for failed prophecy. I mean, nobody's getting their money back. Okay, I'm going to teach and not be on those things. Cause I, and, and all of my heart, some of you are just getting to know me and this sort of stuff. We're getting to know you guys and we love it. And we're so thankful for Grace Culture and Jake and the lead team here and the stuff that's getting done. I'm thrilled with what's happening here. Um, uh, but my heart is truly not bent towards fighting something. It's bent towards building something. So we're not here to fight against ideas or fight against concepts or fight against perspective. I've got friends and leaders and ministers and partners that I link arms with and hands with that are on many different uh, pathways uh, in these thoughts. So it's not a, uh, you know, it's not denominational. You don't have to believe this way or you're gone, right? Uh, and so in that, let me just give you a quick commercial why I got you here. We just finished our new five-hour online course called The Future According to Hope. And it's five hours fully on eschatology. Uh, and so we go much further than we're able to do uh, in, uh, in this conference this weekend and take some different paths that I'm not going to take uh, this weekend. And so I want to encourage you to enroll in that class. Our first class is called the Foundations of Hope. Because if you don't understand biblical hope, sometimes this kind of eschatology doesn't even make sense. Because you think you know what hope is, but probably you just understand it as a wish. Because that's mostly what most of our culture understands that word as. So Foundations of Hope. And then we have another new class called Hope Awakened Sonship so that you can understand who you are. And when you understand who he is and you understand who you are, your, very, your heart becomes very aware that perhaps the future is going to look differently than what I've been told. So we've tried to build uh, now at this point, those three classes total up to 20 hours worth of teaching that you can enroll in and enjoy and gain from on your schedule at your home, anywhere that you want. Simply have a device on the internet and you can jump on there and do that. So if you want some more on this, um, I want to encourage you to do that. Um, I don't know. Let me do this. I'm going to set this down for a second and show you this. No, I got it. I brought these with me. Um, these are all books that I've studied and read and been through on this particular topic, uh, either, both either on covenant and or directly dealing with areas of eschatology. And I only show you that I'm not a brainiac. So this is, this is killer for me. Um, when I was younger, I wouldn't even have held one of these books this size. I'd have, I'd have only dealt with these books this size. Um, but I brought these uh, for you to see because I get a lot of questions um, a lot of times on what do you study, what books are there, et cetera. And that's, that's just a sampling um, uh, of what's out there. It also lets you know that um, the stuff that you're hearing Jake communicate, myself communicate, is not something he and I just came up with last week. Because yeah. <clears throat> when I just, all the stuff that I was thinking uh, about 10, 12 years ago, when I realized that I wasn't the only one thinking that 
or looking that way and begin to, it was like, you ever play that computer game? Here's dating ourselves, right? Have you ever played that game Minesweeper? We're on the computer and you click that thing and the whole little area explodes open kind of a deal. When I hit some minesweeper buttons on realizing that there was an enormous amount of revelation and input and people's study over decades, et cetera, that were, whew, I dove into that and almost didn't sleep most nights. I, I just, pfft, duh. and so I say all that to say that there is an enormous amount of revelation and information out there that you can receive from, and I encourage you to do that uh, as you study, right? Um, so let me see if I can help us this morning. I'm gonna go a little different path myself than perhaps I've done before uh, on this topic, uh, because I really, and, and Jake kind of started it, um, uh, because you really have to understand the reality of covenants, and you have to understand the reality that scripture, our Bible, as Jake said so well, is built around covenants. It's actually a whole book of covenants. And so there's many covenants primarily um, that then, you know, what we know is the Old Testament has many covenants in it. But what we call the Old Covenant is generally just understood as the Mosaic Covenant, right? Which was the one that Jesus came to put an end to because it really wasn't the covenant that revealed Father. Jesus reveals Father. I'll say that again. We'll just think about it as we go. Jesus reveals Father. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is the statement of God. He is the eternal Word. And so that Word is the paramount Word. So Jesus, the greater, always trumps the lesser, right? And so when we see that and we understand those pieces, we're able to then see scripture through a lens of this is what's going on in this covenant, this is what's going on in this covenant, and this is what's going on in this covenant. Let me start maybe by showing it to you this way. We'll, we're, not, we're obviously not going to deal with Abrahamic covenant, Noahic covenant, Davidic covenant. We're not, <laughs> all of those, although they're important to understand because actually, uh, the Davidic covenant is, uh, is much in line with what the new covenant is. Because I'll teach you in another session today the different kinds of covenants that there are. Um, but if you can see this, this will help you, I think, and go along. We understand the Mosaic covenant was given at Mount Sinai, right? If this falls, it's because my little tray is not on there. Um, so we understand that Moses went up Mount Sinai, right? And got the Ten Commandments up there. Have you ever noticed that the word of God to Moses was not come up here and get the law? God never said to Moses, come up here and get the law. What he said was to all of Israel, come up here. Matter of fact, it would have just been the Hebrews back then, right? Coming out of Egypt. Come up here and hear my voice. That's an entirely different situation than come up here and get the law. Clear back at Sinai, the heartbeat of Father always was come up here and be led by the Spirit. When you talk, breath exhales, am I right? Numa, spirit, breath, come up here and hear my voice, come up here and receive my spirit, come up here and live directed by my spirit has always been the Father's heartbeat. But what was the Israelites' response? No chance. I'm not going up there. Y'all send Moses up there, tell us what he wants, give us the list that he wants done so that we can be okay. Because you've got 400 years of slavery entrenched in the mindset. 400 years of slavery to Pharaoh, who is not just the king in those days, he's actually seen as God. 
And so for 400 years, the Israelites only understood God as a taskmaster and as a whip holder and as a beater and as one who, if you don't do what I say, you will be punished and you will receive my wrath and you will receive my anger. And matter of fact, I'll even take hay and straw from you and demand more bricks out of you. And if you can't keep up with that, I'll beat you some more. 400 years of this, we, America hasn't even been here for 400 years yet. 400 years of entrenched generation after generation after generation that you must live exactly by the word of Pharaoh or you will be uh, punished and you will receive his wrath and you will be beaten. So that's the mindset of the Israelites down here at the bottom of Mount Sinai. These are, I'm trying to not knock my board off of the thing, but they're gathered around the bottom of Mount Sinai and this voice starts thundering from on top of that thing saying, come up here and hear my voice. So I can be your God and you will be my better understanding would be sons. And so in that, they're down here going, um, do you know how bad God is? Because you don't understand Pharaoh. That was God then. You know how tough that guy is? Well, this guy on top of this mountain just wiped Pharaoh out in the sea back there. So this guy talking at the top of the mountain is bad enough to take care of the guy that we've been scared of for 400 years. And if that guy is bad enough to take out that guy and that guy treated us like he did, you can understand real quickly how their mind says, like, ain't no chance I'm going up here. Are you kidding me? Just give us the rules you want so we can know that we won't receive your wrath. That's actually called a, um, uh, sorry, my brain just went blank. That's actually called a vassal covenant. Historically, through history, there's been many vassal covenants. Vassal covenants is always a covenant or a treaty made by a conquering king to the subjects that he just conquered that would say, if you follow my rules, then you won't receive my wrath. In other words, if you follow the rules of mine, you'll be protected. In other words, I will tell you what has to be done in order for you to not receive my wrath. And so, God at the top of Mount Sinai as a father was offering to the Israelites at Mount Sinai what's called a grant covenant. A grant covenant is a covenant that says that the superior will give you everything with no requirements from you. A vassal covenant says you must live up to everything I've told you or you will be punished. Is anyone seeing the difference? So it becomes very quickly and very easy for us to understand what covenant did Jesus bring us? A grant covenant. I will handle what is required by the covenant and give you the benefits without you having to do anything. Most of humanity looks at that and it says that's too good to be true. And we really struggle with that. We really struggle with the reality that Jesus really did something that amazing. We sing amazing grace, but we just kind of don't really think about how amazing it is. Because we don't really recognize that what Jesus did in and through grace was as he took care of everything and just gives it to us as a gift with no requirements from us. We really struggle with that. Because we're really bent towards a vassal covenant that says, tell me what you want so I can do it because we like check sheets to be able to say we accomplished it. And the pride part of us and the pride in us wants to say, look what I was able to do. So if something does go wrong, you've got a reason to fight with God. We have a reason to say, well, now I've been praying 
and I've been at church every week and I've been given and I've been serving the poor and I've been and I've been and I've been and I've been and now it's time that I get my healing because I've done A, B, C, and D. Now give me my healing. We like to live that way because it's a part of our old nature that wants to say I can accomplish. It's the same thing that happened at the tree in the garden. The deception at the tree of the garden was is God didn't do enough for you, so you have to do it for yourself. Come and eat from this tree and then you'll be like God. So come and take matters into your own hands and do it your way so you can be God. That's the deception that happened in the garden. And it's still the deception that entangles us most of the time too, that we're going to do it our way. It's what happened at Sinai. Just give us what to do because we don't want to receive your wrath. When all along, Father was saying, come up and hear my voice. In other words, know my heart and live by that. So a covenant got put in place back in Sinai called a vassal covenant, a mosaic covenant that has always been a veil to what Father's like. The old covenant did not show us, Father. Jesus did. The law doesn't show us, Father. Jesus does. What does the law, I know grace culture gets to hear this pretty often. What does the law teach us? Sin and death, right? And now what Paul said, it was the law that taught us like a schoolmaster what sin is. So the law was a revealing of sin why Jesus was the revealing of Father. Okay, I'm going to breathe on that one myself. So what happened back here at Sinai was not put in place as a revelation of Father. It was put in place because of what man wanted. It's hefty to chew on. I kind of went ahead and dropped that bomb. Father actually responded to man's wishes for a vassal covenant when he actually offered them a grant covenant. And the best news yet, ever, is that Jesus came and said, nah, that's not going to cut it because you can't see Father. And when you can't see Father, you can't understand yourself. And when you can't understand, your, when, when, you, when you can't understand Father correctly and understand you correctly, you are trapped in deception that will continually produce sin, that will constantly cause thorns and thistles to be produced in your life, right? Because the result of sin is what? Death. Thorns, thistles, heartaches, brokenness, destruction, etc. So the goodness of Father has always wanted to liberate us from the results of brokenness and sin and death. And the only way to do that was to get the law out of the way. Because the law was only interested in teaching us sin. So what was going on there was never what Father wanted. The Mosaic Covenant was never, was never an eternal covenant. The Mosaic Covenant was not in play before Sinai. The covenant we're in now is the everlasting covenant. Am I right? It's the eternal covenant, which means it was not the covenant in play that started at the cross. It was the covenant in play all the way before creation. It's always what fathers had to offer. He offered it to Abraham before there was ever a law. Because you do know Abraham wasn't a Jew. He was the father of faith, not the father of law. He wasn't a Jew, there wasn't a, there wasn't a nation, there wasn't Israelites, there wasn't law, right? So Abraham 
back clear back then, God offered him a grant. I will do this for you and you will be the reception of it. I will give you as an inheritance this, 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 and this. Did Abraham ever do anything to earn that? Did Abraham ever, was he, he could, he, there wasn't even the sacrificial system in play. So if you can hear it this way, sin was just screaming in all of its fullness. And God walked right up to Abraham and said, I'm going to give you all this. With the full measure of sin in play. Wow. So there he was, getting offered something that he couldn't do anything about except receive. That's why he's called the father of faith. Faith is receiving <laughs> what's been offered. So that's how it got started back there with Abraham, right? So that's all, it's always been a grant covenant has always been what father has been after so that we could see him as a father and us as sons and not him as a taskmaster and us as slaves. But Sinai functioned through a taskmaster, taskmaster slave mindset. How much of Christianity is still functioning from a taskmaster slave mindset? How much are you? Facebook world, how much are you still functioning from a taskmaster slave mindset? Give me the list to do so I can do it and then I'll be a good son and daughter. And so what went on was his father was not okay for man to continually live with a veil over our eyes, to live with a separating understanding of who father is and who we are right because it happened at the temple at the moment of christ's death on the cross right what was ripped veil that which has always blocked us from seeing father was removed by what happened at the cross because there's no greater love as a man has than to lay his life down for his brother so the laying down of jesus's life was the revelation of father's love So that's what happened to conclude this covenant, to say uh, no more. There had to be one, right, to satisfy this covenant. Jesus accomplished all that because, oh man, got too many points that need to come out at one time. Can you hear five different sentences? Can I? So see if I can, it, so uh, let me finish this point and then I'll move to that point. So the Mosaic covenant started at its zenith. In other words, it started at its highest point of glory because when Moses came down off of the mountain, his face was what? Shining so brightly, he had to do what? Put a veil over it. I'll teach you more out of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13 later today. But the old covenant started at its zenith, at its brightest, highest point. And it was not an everlasting covenant, was it? It was never determined to last forever. So it had an expiration date on it, like the hamburger in your refrigerator, right? Don't eat this after this date. Because if you do, it could make you really sick. I'm kind of done eating rotten meat. Just, just saying. And so when you got the old covenant starting at the zenith, where did it go from there? Down. It started declining and declined and declined and declined so much so that the glory that was once screaming bright on Moses' face was dimming, dimming, dimming. So the veil was not to block the brightness but the veil was in order to cover up the dimming of the glory. Could you imagine trying to lead the millions of people that your face was once shining so bright like the sun and then a few hundred years later, it's like down to a candle? What do you think those people are gonna think about you as a leader? Your face used to look like the sun. We couldn't even look at it. Now look at you. That's a whole other point. But it declined, right? 
And then the new covenant came into play as a mustard seed. Right? Look, little hay. Little baby Jesus came in an insignificant place called Bethlehem. Came in a came in a place of unknown, not in the ways expected as some valiant king riding on a white horse, but as a baby, as a mustard seed. And what does Matthew 13 tell us the mustard seed does? It grows into the tree until it becomes the predominant tree of the entire garden. That which was put in the seed that was sown in was also the leaven, Matthew 13, that gets put in the lump that you can't get out, you can't extract it. And what does that leaven do? It continues to grow until it takes over the whole lump, right? And not only take over the whole lump, but cause the whole lump to rise to significance, to rise to the place of nourishment and usability. None of us want to go eat a lump of dough, do you? But man, you put that thing in an oven and let that yeast do what it does, we all be running out of here to get that, right? Fresh bread has got something serious about it. It's attractive, it's appealing, it's savory, it causes you to want it. So Jesus was put into history, right? Back in Bethlehem as a leaven that would take over the whole lump and you can't get it out. And that leaven continued to grow, continued to increase as the everlasting covenant, right? You and I are part of the covenant that is ever growing, ever expanding from glory to glory. It's ongoing. It's ever increasing. It moved out of a manger, right? Up to the top of a mountain again called Golgotha. Am I right? That's a tomb with the stone rolling away, right? Increased glory. How many of you recognize the resurrection has more glory than the crucifixion? I don't know about you, but I'd rather resurrect than die. Matter of fact, I'm willing to die in order for there to be a resurrection. I think that's how Jesus said it, right? I'll endure this because of this. So it's ever increasing glory. We understand, of course, then Jesus hung out for 40 days and taught the kingdom to all of his disciples and everyone around. And then he did what? Right back to the right hand of the Father. And what happened at that? Woo! The outpouring of the Spirit of God in the upper room, Acts 2, increase in glory, because now we're going from centralized in one person to universalized in everyone. The presence of God is now no longer accessible in one room called the Holy of Holies in the temple in the city of Jerusalem only. The Spirit has now been poured out on all flesh and is available to all people at any time, anywhere in all of the world. Whew, that is serious. We, we, we're so far removed from it, we, we really don't have a grid work for that. But back here, only one person called the high priest could even experience the presence of God. And that was only one time a year only in one location and only if he had done everything right. Yep. They put that rope on his foot for a reason. Yep. You drop dead up in there. Not because God wants you to be dead, but because the law demands it. This is the result of what they wanted. It was the result of the wrong tree. Sinai, they ate from the wrong tree again. They didn't go eat from the tree of life, his voice. They went and ate from a tree of knowledge, of knowing, of determining, I want this, I want to live this way and by these rules. Whew. Everybody doing all right? How much more time I got? Oh boy. It's a good thing we got more sessions today, right? So I'm trying to tell us that the 
Oh, yeah, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened on the upper room, right? And then what happened? Acts chapter 2. Sons and daughters are released. Sons and daughters are sent from the upper room, full of the Spirit of God, full of the life of God, full of the giftings of God, released as His force into the earth, released as the ecclesia in the earth, released as the church, to then go do what? Disciple nations in the kingdom, love, joy, peace. That's what's been going on ever since. How many of you recognize we're in a lot better state in 2016 than we've ever been in history? Oh, now wait a minute. Now you're messing with me because this is the worst it's ever been. Have you seen the news? Uh, no, sorry. You really ought to look into history and see how bad it was. You really ought to look into the barbaric nature of mankind. You really ought to look at what it was like when the amount of kids that died from sickness and disease that parents would have to hold. I know there's tough things happening in the earth. My head's not in the sand. Matter of fact, I'm pretty mad about a lot of it because it doesn't have to be that way because we've got the kingdom here with us. And if the sons and daughters of God will quit trying to evacuate and actually start infiltrating, we wouldn't continue to see these amounts of ever increasing sons and daughters that would shape the nations for the glory of God. So we've gotten better. History has gotten better. We're sitting in air conditioning this morning. Isn't that better? We have light bulbs on. Isn't that better? I've got a plastic thing with metal on it with wires that's taking my voice and sending it back there and it's coming out of wires and going into these boxes that have paper with magnets on the back of it. And you're hearing my voice the same time you're watching my mouth move. <laughs> glory. I'm not kidding. That's glory. And the reality of it is, is all of that used to be in the dirt. Everything that makes this plastic, everything that makes this metal, everything that makes the copper and the wires and the magnets, and some, everything that makes the paper, all of it was once in the dirt. Whoo! This glory right here was in the dirt back when Adam and Eve walked on the earth. They didn't unpack this glory. Our generation got to unpack this glory. How's this glory? Are you kidding me? Not even talking about all the things it allows us to do in the world. The simple fact that everything that was in this was in the dirt. And God enabled mankind to have enough wisdom, knowledge, ingenuity to take dirt And turn it into this. All the glass on this was it once dirt. All the plastic, all the wires, dirt. I can call someone on the other side of the world right now. And some kind of signal, so some kind of wave comes out of this, hits a metal tower, goes clear up into outer space and hits some more metal up in outer space and comes clear back down to earth, to the other side of the earth. And the guy will hear my voice almost instantaneously the time that it comes out of my mouth. Boom! I just get, glory, are you kidding me? Here's the punchline. If creation can come up with this, then how amazing must the creator be? We had enough here to come up with this from what he put in the dirt. This was in, in the garden, this was potential glory. Now in my hand, it's realized glory. Jesus, I feel God all over that. So what's the potential glory in your life that you need to start digging out till it becomes the realized glory in your life? Come on. Glory, 
to glory to glory. I didn't even get to where I, I legitly didn't even get to the verse I was going to start on. I just talked that whole session and did not even get to the first verse. But I wanted us to see in this that if you can understand what happened back in Sinai from this, can anyone see a reason why it needed to come to an end? And so in that, what Jake was talking about so well was that there was a 40-year season where both covenants were in play at the same time, to which all of the New Testament writers were saying to those of the first century, you better make sure everything's straight and together and get over here in this covenant because out of his grace and mercy, he's given you 40 years to make the transition. How many of you need God's grace and mercy to take 40 years to make a transition? Whew, Jesus. Jesus said, as Jake pointed out, this generation will not pass away. Do you know in AD 70, the historic event of the Romans invading Jerusalem and destroying the temple, the same high priest that Jesus looked at was the same high priest that watched the temple destroyed? Caiaphas was still alive. It was his generation. But Jesus said, some of you will not die, but you will see the end of the age. Caiaphas saw the end of the age. Do you know in 70 AD, all of the believers in Jerusalem heeded the words of the apostles? And when you see these signs, get out of the city and run to the mountains. Josephus, the Jewish historian, records that not one Christian believer was killed in Jerusalem in the siege of AD 70. They all got out because they all knew the apostles were talking to them in that moment, not to us in our moment. The amount of deaths and earthquakes and famines and diseases and false prophets and false teachers that were in Jerusalem building up to the year 8070 was unbelievable. Titus actually, well, I don't think I don't I don't think the first general was Titus, came in 67 AD, surrounded the city. And for some unexplainable reason, they took a break and retreated. And all the Christians ran out of the city and went and hid. And the next thing you know, they came back and destroyed the city. Sounds like three and a half years. And then three and a half years just trying to connect some dots from other teachings. <clears throat> Sounds like seven years of tribulation. If you read Josephus' account in the Jewish wars, you will understand what tribulation looks like. We're living in cream puff land compared to what was going on in 70 AD. I'm sorry, but ISIS has not yet been able to do what the Romans did in Jerusalem. It was mass genocidal homicide slaughtering of all life. And not one stone was left upon another of that temple. Every one of them was wiped out, burnt to the ground. So much so that it's been 2,000 years worth of effort to try to rebuild it and they still can't. Because you know why? Because Father said we're done with that. That will never happen again. I'm so sad over the billions of dollars that are being sent from the Christian church to try to rebuild the Jewish temple. When God blew it up, why are we trying to rebuild it? Sorry, that'll wreck a lot of things, but it's five to 12. <laughs> it's time for me to go home. See you guys later. Okay, then let me do this. Deuteronomy chapter 31, since I left it just there, I want to show you Moses' prophecy. Moses prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem before Jesus did. Almost the last thing Moses said before he died 
was a prophecy that this destruction is going to come. It's called the Song of Moses. But let's look at ver uh, chapter 31 in Deuteronomy. Verse 29, Moses is talking and he says, for I know that after my death, you, well, let's back up just one for the fun of it, verse 28, to see who he's talking to. Moses said, assemble me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to witness against them. Can I pause for a minute and let you know that in old covenant mosaic days, the pattern of the temple, where'd my marker go? Dang. The pattern of the temple, you guys have probably seen some kind of temple teaching that shows you that, right? The outer court, the inner court, holy of holies, right? The outer court had no roof, so it was open to sunlight, natural light was how it was lit. The inner court, right, had the menorah, candlesticks. It was roofed. It was a covered room with candlesticks. And then, obviously, in the Holy of Holies was the Shekinah. The glory of God lit the room, right? <clears throat> Out here in Jewish culture, the outer courts was known as the earth. That's where everyone gathered. The men, the women, the Jews and the Gentiles all gathered in the outer court. So that was called the earth, the inner court or specifically the Holy of Holies where God and man met was called what? The heavens. How do we even know heaven? We even know the word heaven to mean where God and man are together. You know, the only thing important about heaven is that God's there. Take God out of heaven, there's no point to go. Not even to see your old loved ones. If you value heaven because your family's there over the reality that God's there, then you've got your heart parked on the wrong thing, right? So if the only thing important and the only thing that makes heaven heaven is God, are you without God now? So where are you trying to go? Maybe perhaps you haven't realized how much of God you're allowed to have here because you're still trying to get somewhere to have more of him somewhere else. So what you in a hurry for? I'm already in heaven. Are you in Christ? I'm in Christ. That was a, you, it's not your question. Are you in Christ? I'm in Christ. I can't get more in Christ. I'm trying to tell you about this. In the Old Covenant Mosaic language, I'm going to trip over this thing all day. The Old Covenant Mosaic language, the inner court was called heaven. In the outer court was called earth. Revelation chapter 21. For behold, I give you a new heaven and a new earth because the old heaven and the old earth has passed away. That's gone. So now we have a new heaven and a new earth. We have a new temple. <clears throat> Who's that? One step better, Revelation 21 says that in the New Jerusalem, there is no temple because Jesus is the temple. So I was reading. That's why I've got five hours online of this. What did Moses say right here? Verse 28. Bring all these people together so I can speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to a witness against them. Who's Moses calling as a witness against them? It would have been the tabernacle back then, right? So he's calling the law system, the sacrificial system, the temple system, he's calling it a witness. 
to what, listen, here's what he says. I call it a witness against them, for I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the ways that I have commanded you. You will break the law and you will turn from the covenant the which you made with God. So can you hear this? And in those, in, in the days to come, evil will befall you because you will do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger through the work of your hands. So what did Moses call as a witness against them? Heaven and earth. You did what was wrong according to this covenant. And because you couldn't live the covenant, the covenant, hear this, hear this, and I'll be done. The covenant demands my anger and my wrath, not my heart. What was his heart? His heart clear back there was a grant covenant. But you didn't want a grant covenant. You wanted a vassal covenant. So because of that, we made a covenant. And because I'm a God who can't break covenants, this is the covenant you put me into. So I have to respond accordingly to the covenant. And the covenant, the law, demands that if you break the rules of the covenant, you die. The covenant demands that if you do evil, you get my wrath. That was not the heart of God. That was the stipulations of the covenant. God was legally bound to pour out wrath he never wanted to pour out because he never had it to pour out to start with. If he had it to pour out to start with, he'd have done it in the garden. Jesus, God help us. If he had wrath to pour out, if that was what his heart was, was wrath and anger, it would have exploded in the garden. It would have exploded at Cain and Abel. Are you kidding me? Abel killed his brother. And I hate to make it sound anything less, but he just got sent off to that city. Why didn't the wrath of God pour out on Abel? Because that's not who Father is. But that's who the law is. The law is wrath. The law is anger. The law is punishment when you break the law. Do you think the judge, even in our U.S. court system, is really wrathful? But what's he bound to when you break the law? That judge is bound to give you the results of the law. He's not personally mad at you and he's not angry at you and he's not pouring his wrath out on you, putting you in jail for the rest of your life. He's simply carrying out the bonds of the law. So Moses, before he dies, says to all of Israel, because you wanted this law, heaven and earth, because you wanted this system, because you wanted this interaction with Father based on these terms, you've now held him to these terms and you're going to end up messing up all along and it's going to demand that Father pours out the wrath that the law demands. Look in verse 32, or chapter 32. Verse 35. read these verses out of context of covenant it really messes up the understanding verse 35 says vengeance is mine doesn't that just sound like an angry God why is vengeance his because he's bound by the law and he's the only one that can execute the punishment not you and not someone else 
He is the one who is held by the covenant. Hear this. He's the one who's held by the covenant in order to release vengeance upon broken law. Can you imagine, can you think even under the law how many times God released mercy? Keep thinking. Keep thinking because they broke it as soon as they got it. Matter of fact, he came down from the mountain and had a golden calf going on down there. I'm pretty sure the verse commandment said, have no other gods before me. And while God's up there writing it on stone, they're down there having other gods before him. The first moment of the law, mercy still trumped judgment. Moses got mad and broke them and had to go up and get a whole new pile of them. You know why? Because he didn't want to go climb that mountain again. That's simple. <laughs> <laughs> you needed a laugh. <laughs> Moses all along, or God all along, has always had mercy, triumph, judgment. Matter of fact, at one point, Israel was, was messing up everything so bad with the law, Father was like, I have to, according to the law, wipe all of you out. And what did Moses do? Nah, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Please don't do it. And what what father do? OK, I will show mercy over the judgment the law is releasing. Because the law would have demanded Israel to be wiped out right there. He's sovereign, which means he can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. Am I right? If that's true, then justice does not control God. God controls justice. So whatever he determines is just, is the way it goes. Not what you and I think justice is. So when the law demanded death, God overrode that sentence with mercy and said mercy is justice not judgment. When you and I became born again, that was God's justice. Come on, someone catch this. Mercy is justice, not judgment. Put that, on, put that in your glasses and try to live life that way. So when someone wrongs you, justice is mercy towards them, not judgment. When your kids do wrong things, I've got four of them. And I've got to figure out how to release mercy as justice, not wrath. Punishment is not justice, mercy is. I'm trying to tell you right here, I just, vengeance is mine. And recompense, which it is the word actually, I will repay. Repay for what? I have to repay what the law demands for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand, for their doom comes swiftly. Jump down to verse 41. If I sharpen my flashing uh, sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries. Guess what? Those... Those adversaries were not the Hittites, the Canaanites. The adversaries were the Israelites who break the law. And I'll make my arrows drunk with blood, et cetera, et cetera. I just wanted to show us all of this to say before Moses died, he said the end result of this covenant is going to be destruction and wrath because that's what the law demands. Skip forward. What did Jesus say? Upon this generation will all the wrath from the blood clear back to Abel will be poured out on this generation. That generation, 70 AD, in the city of Jerusalem received all of the law's requirement for wrath clear back to Cain killing Abel and all of the wrath of the law got dumped out in 70 AD. It's not in our future. It's what already happened. happened 
Let's go eat lunch. We'll be back later. Thanks. Bless you.